So, hello. Today I will be talking about some stories. So I will take you to a trip about agile transformation. And uh, just at the beginning, how many of you are from some very small company? Few. Some mid-size, up to 500, for example. And more than 500. OK. So for all of you, I hope you will find some aspects which sounds familiar for you, and some which you say, well, we are quite glad it's not about us. So, but let's start to think a little bit uh, what Agile mean to you. Just give a picture in your head, think about some transformation you came through. And when I came to the companies, they sometimes say, well, it's we knew Agile Manifesto. That's all these four principles, boring. And we knew Scrum. So Agile is about Scrum, right? It's the same thing. Well, not that quite, but uh, most of the companies think so now. Maybe some will say, well, then we knew Kanban. It's uh, another buzzword. Well, they're good as well. And very few say, well, there are some extreme programming as well, XP practices. And we use them, by the way, or not. And some of them will just have in their head quite clear, exact process. Sounds familiar, I guess, for you. So, And very few will say, well, it's not that quiet. It's not about the processes. It's not about uh, practices. But it's something which will improve the way how we work. It's something which is fast, dynamic, flexible. It should help us to find a way to our customer. And for some companies, most of my clients, by the way, it's just something strange. And this is a fish, by the way. Here it has an eye, exactly here. And here is a uh, mouse. It's called frogfish. It's a very strange fish. It doesn't even swim almost. It's just like moving like that, really not uh, anything nice. Looks like one of these corals it is sitting on. And I think this picture just shows you how agile is. Agile is a process, kind of process. The same way how this fish is compared to shark, for example. So it's something completely else. It's something really new to the most of the companies. Maybe not to you, because you are already working for all those agile companies. But at the beginning, when you start the journey, which I promised, there is some person sitting in his office at the chair. And uh, at the very beginning, he has an idea. And he's like saying, well, I heard so many stories about that thing, Agile. So I think it's easy. We should, uh, we should uh, try it. So that's a good intention at the beginning. Is it enough? Well, maybe, I don't know. But uh, you need some very good reason, better than you just hear about it in the radio or TV or from your friend. And one of those reasons is that you might have a very poor quality product. It's just a piece of crap. It's something which never worked, something old which is not working anymore, something which you cannot be really proud of. That's one of the reasons. Second, maybe you feel not efficient. Well, actually, when I started my first job as a programmer, I've been doing some simple uh, parser from uh, reading data from the defibrillator into the diskit at that time, saving it into XML format. And I did like the programming job for two weeks, then the testing, all, all the automation in another two weeks, and then these huge piles of documentations for at least one month. And then we've been discussing over emails for three next months about this documentation. We've been not really efficient, I would say. We've got a higher quality. The product was very good. It was saving people's lives. It was pacemakers and defibrillators. But the efficiency was just horrible. And that was one of the reasons why we switched for Agile at that time. Or maybe another reason which you might find interesting for you is low flexibility. You need 
of, especially in the corporations, you need all those allocations, nine months up front, one hour uh, exact for all the people in the company. It occupies all those managers for a very long time. So they are filling all these Excel sheets or some internal systems, and your flexibility is quite close to zero, actually. So once any change came from the field or from your customer or from whatever else, you're just saying, well, you know, we don't have that people allocated, so we can't do that product. And we can't do the change because we don't have that person ready. But if you wait six months or maybe even more, then we can do it. Or some companies, which is quite surprising, are just coming and saying, well, we want the agile because we are kind of uh, missing a fun. We have the people who are sitting at their desk, programming, testing, doing the job. And they just take whatever task it came from here, they proceed it and put it there. They don't really care what it is. If you tell them, do it right, they do it right. If you tell them, do it the other way, they do it the other way. They don't think about it. But that's another reason. If you want more fun, that's kind of a thing to do. Or maybe you just need this crystal globe to predict when your product is done. That's another reason why you might be willing to watch and see what Agile brings. It's about the poor predictability. And there is another reason which is kind of common. They're just these managers sitting in their offices, they are just saying, well, let's try something new. It's a good idea. I heard a lot about that agile thing. It sounds good. We will be more flexible, cheaper, more efficient. Our customer will be more satisfied. There will be no bugs. They just now, this word, it's nothing special, but there it would be perfect. So he's sitting back in his office and saying, like, well, how shall we start? So let's read some blogs, articles, and let's buy some book and um, uh, read the websites. And uh, it seems so, so easy. It's a piece of cake, by the way. Just a few principles people over the processes, yeah, 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 blah, 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 and so on. Well, there's some iterations, some stand-up meetings, retrospectives. It's not too bad. We can implement it just like that. So he's saying, well, starting from tomorrow, we are agile. And we know enough. So let's try. But the reality is often not so Nice. It's kind of a depressing sometimes and so on. So you start with your developers, for example. They are sitting in their office. They used to be sitting in their offices and just sitting next to their computer and coding. Doesn't look left or right. They've been just coding whatever it came from this site. And what you say was just told those people, well, now you are a group of people. You're a team, by the way. And you will be doing Scrum, and you will be sitting together and having fun and doing all those iterations and all these discussions. But what happened, actually? In most of the companies, you've got three departments here. These two guys, they are developers. And they love coding. They don't like much talking around and uh, they are not really into talking to the customer either. And their ultimate goal is to write a piece of code in order the requirement is working and just throw it away to somebody who is called accidentally the tester. So yeah, we have those testers. They are coming from different department. They are not really got used to working with, the, with these two guys. Why they should. They are waiting at the other side of the wall and catching the pieces of a code and searching for a bugs. And if they found one single bug, they just throw it back and say, well, it's not working. And that's pretty much all. It's nothing about the co cooperation. It's nothing about helping each other. All those things are kind of missing. 
And of course, in some companies, we have the analysts. Again, hidden in their walls, they are just writing the documentation about the code. So what happened at the beginning is that you have these three groups. They are hidden between these walls. And you just say, well, now you are not three different departments. You are in one team. And you should cooperate. You should talk together. You should work together. You should even sit together and do the pair programming. Or maybe you, as a tester, might want to sit with this guy and help him to write a code without the bugs. And maybe even with that one and you with these two as well, and uh, you should learn, teach the team how to do really a good software. Because you are the expert on all the requirements, and you should help the analyst, by the way, as well. So that's kind of a thing. And there is another thing which is happening here. All those people, mostly, attend to some schools. And then uh, at school, you know, if you should help each other, they call it cheating. So you don't do that much. And now at work, they should tell you, well, help each other. It's not about you to find a solution. And then most of them came from the university. And at the university, they teach you, well, you are the only expert. You will find solution to any problem ever. Which is cool, by the way. So they don't ask for help, because they will find the solution eventually. In one day, one week, maybe more, who knows. So that's all we are going to break. And how they feel? Well, nothing really special. They are talking too much, they don't have the time to work. They are not really happy about the transformation, about the whole Agile. So when the manager came and asked, well, how do you like it, guys? Well, they said most likely something like, well, you know, we don't like it much, we don't have the time to work, it's really so much talking, and it's really strange, this process. Maybe it's for a very small company. That could work. And if you are in a smaller company, you're saying, well, you know, maybe it's for some bigger company because we are already efficient. Or whatever else, maybe it's for the company with a different product. So they just don't feel comfortable. And then, next, you're just building more of those teams and put all the iterations in and saying like, well, we do at the beginning of the iteration the planning, and then uh, we do the customer demo and show it to the customer. And it's all the mess all around your company. Everybody is just moving somewhere to stand up, from stand up. We want you at our stand up, and so on and so on. So all you hear are just complaints. They just don't like it, usually. But the reason why is that just, they just follow the process without real understanding. If you ask them why did we switch for Agile and or Scrum or whatever, they usually say, well, well, our manager wants it. Or it was something new we want to try. We don't know really why. They didn't explain. So. The person is sitting back in his office. He did this tour around the team, walk around, ask those people, are you happy? Not really. And he's saying, well, like, you know, it seems like Agile is not for us. I've got such a huge expectation. It would be such a great and now it's not for us. But it's about the climate and the culture. And Agile will eventually change it. So this change is the most difficult change ever. So if you want to be successful, you must focus on these two things. And you must understand what it's really about. And it's about this picture. This is the change which really happened. These are the individual working people sitting in their cubicles or just virtual cubicles working alone, don't help each other. If you ask those people if they cooperate, they say, yes, of course. Once I finish my task, when it's done, every like two weeks, maybe three weeks, or sometimes even one week, 
I'll go to my colleague and give it to him so he can continue. Or sometimes uh, we need to do some synchro synchroniz synchronization. So, yes, we cooperate. There's no problem with that. And by the way, if you ask the managers if they like this, they say, no, no, no. We don't like to have any chaos. That doesn't look like uh, people are at work. They're not serious. They're having fun. But it's exactly about this problem. And it would be difficult for the developers, testers, and analysts. And it will be even more difficult for the managers to understand this picture. And you must learn how to look at your product from the business perspective, from customer's eyes. So you have to be sitting in the head of your customer, looking through his eyes into what you are doing. That's, again, one of the most difficult steps you have to do. And then, from internal perspective, it's team responsibility to find out how you are going to work. Because Agile is not anything strict, it's not a cookbook. So no one can help you. Well, lots of people can give you advices, but no one can decide, instead of you, how are you going to work and how are you going to put it together. So it's a team responsibility. You have to find your way how to be successful, happy, flexible, and so on. And it's about self-organization. So the same way as these aunts are looking for a way and trying to find out where to go next and helping each other, rely on each other, the team should react. And I have a video for you. What does it mean, the self-organization? So I will show you. Untamed and uncut. Winter in the Antarctic Peninsula. Tom and Sharon Merritt are aboard a tour ship and the sights are breathtaking. <laughs> Suddenly, over the loudspeaker, the announcement they'd hoped for. Orca spotted. The Merritts and the rest of the passengers race to the ship's bridge level. What they witness is an event so rare, it's been documented by scientists only 13 times. And never photographed. These orca are going to attack this seal. A family of orcas has set its sights on a crab eater seal resting on an ice floe. Watch as the orcas raise their massive eight ton bodies vertically to peek over the ice floe. Whale biologist Dr. Ingrid Visser says the movement is called spy hopping. The ice floe was about 25 feet square. Uh, but it kept getting smaller, I think, through the action of the orca. And it appears they don't like the location of the flow either. The orcas attempt to isolate it from nearby flows. They're twisting the ice. Seven-eighths of the ice flow is actually below the surface. But these behemoth creatures are able to use their strength to strategically position the flow. They spin the ice around and they move other pieces of ice away so that they can line it up perfectly to make the biggest wave possible. This highly sophisticated hunting technique is used mostly to help teach young calves how to hunt. Using her blowhole, the matriarch of the pod sends out vocal signals to summon other adult orcas to line up perfectly and then charge the ice, swimming at speeds up to 35 miles an hour. The wave created hurls the doomed seal to the other end, where a hungry orca anticipates a fresh meal. With the second largest brain in the animal kingdom, the orcas are very intelligent. They craft a plan. With a series of clicks and whistles to communicate, the matriarch brings in more members of the pod. Watch carefully as these orcas execute with perfect synchronization. Oh yeah, here they go. Oh, no. And we're five orca. One orca is sitting stationary and it blows this big burst of bubbles, which we think was actually the cue to tell the other orca to come in. You can actually see how the wave created by the crafty orca will simply slide the seal off the flow. Oh, it's all over. No, not huh? right. Yeah, it's all over. Oh. I had some pangs of pain 
for the plight of that poor crab. So, how did you like such a self-organized team? Do you think you are able to work the same way in your company? If you are hungry enough, yeah, of course. So that's how the self-organization should be. I believe that one of those orcas was really great in jumping, for example. And was able to jump high and even do some flops in the middle of the jump. And maybe it would be able to just jump over the ice and catch the seal and eat it. But that's just one out of 10 or 20 or 100. It will not help them to survive. It will not make them efficient and good enough. So that's the same with the software development team. You have one person who is really great Java programmer. And you have another one who is able to break any software ever and is able to find any bug those developers did. So your customers won't find it. Both of them are very useful for the team. They can help the team if it's uh, the time. But they are not doing just that. If some others need help, they just come together, and they are st much stronger in that. So that's about the self-organization. And then you have another problem in front of you doing the transformation. You are trying to do such a family, pretty much, in several levels. I've been already talking about that one of those could be a tester, one of those analyst, one of those developer. They have different goals. They have different things they like. They are different. The tester is uh, very good at searching the differences and bugs. The developer is good at uh, creating things, and the analyst is good at a high-level structure. But they have to find a way how to build a family. And if you go a little bit more up, you have an IT department. Then you have, for example, your sales. And you have a, or business. And you have a managers. Again, three different groups with three quite different goals, usually. So build a family out of them again and uh, try to make them compact. Try to make them having just uh, one single goal. Otherwise, you will never succeed anyway. And it's about searching through the very heavy fog. How do we implement Agile? And what's our way? What shall we do? Shall we listen to that person who is saying, well, do the estimations? And you have to do the uh, relative estimations. Or shall we listen to another one who is saying, well, no, estimations is a waste of time. You don't need to estimate. And shall the stand-up meeting be 15 minutes or 10 minutes? You have to find. You have to decide. And then find out that everyone has a completely different view. You are just uh, able to put a mirror to the team so they see themselves. But everyone sees a bit different picture. So one of the general sentence which you may just remember from that is that everybody is right, partially. Everybody is right in your team, but just partially. And of course, it's about awareness. It's about building a team really strong, being able to say, well, that's the truth. It looks like that to me. Don't look onto everything into the pink glasses just because you feel now it's agile, now we have to say it's great. It's about trusting each other. Because once you start act as a team, you have to trust each other, otherwise you would better be in your cubicle, sitting alone and doing your job alone. So that was all the things which may go wrong and a little bit of things how it should be. And now, how to start? Well, you have two ways. Top down and bottom up, and something in between, of course. Top down looks exactly like that. You have a very strong general manager, strong guy, 
who is coming to the all hands meeting or something like that, or maybe his uh, vice president's meeting and saying, well, from tomorrow we are agile. And there is no discussion, of course, with that guy. Maybe he will tell why, because I want to be more flexible, and I want to be closer to the customers, I want to be more efficient, and you do it. You have it in your KPIs from now. So what happened in that company? And it was a successful approach in a couple of companies, by the way. Those vice presidents just were thinking, oh, what's Agile about? I've never heard really. Well, I heard about it, but what is it about? Well, let's call my directors. So as a vice president, I call my directors here and say, well, by the way, from tomorrow we are Agile. So do your job. And leave, of course. And those directors came back to their uh, managers and say, well, you know, from tomorrow we are Agile. So do your job and make your teams Agile and leave. And then it's going down and down through the structure. And all those people are like thinking, well, OK, what is it? And then it's uh, at the level of the developers and testers and the teams. So they say, well, OK, what's so what this agile about? So let's read something, and let's try it, and let's make it happen somehow. And for some companies, this was really successful approach. Well, this was successful approach. And, uh, but what happened after a couple of years, they found out they've got Agile company pretty much. They've got a lot of uh, Agile teams who are really doing Scrum or Kanban and really understanding the values. But as a huge corporation, they don't have anything which is like common culture or common way that's our Agile. That's the way how we approach it. So it looks more like a kind of strange joint venture of uh, several completely independent Scrum teams who've been doing their way of Agile. And it was not really compatible together much. It was a bit, but not really so much. So after like uh, four years of trying, they are, uh, for example, some of them are now undertaking some culture kind of uh, shift and trying to make it the same or similar. And that's a huge problem because this team is really happy about the way they do it, that team as well. And now someone else is coming and saying, well, you guys, you don't do the good Scrum and you don't do the, you don't do the good Kanban either. Because there is a general rule how our company, ABC, wants to do Scrum and Kanban. So you should change. And those people are already quite strong and saying, well, but it's working for us. We have a very successful product. Our customers are and so on, but nobody's listening. They are just trying to make it similar. There is the other way around. And usually it's when you don't find such a customer, uh, such a general manager who is really strong and really wants Agile for some reasons. Then you just do some kind of a playing or experimenting with Agile, and you try to go bottom up. I do find some people who really love Agile and who's got experiences, so they build their own island and their product, and they are quite doing well. Or maybe you just find one person who said, well, I hear that you are here for Agile, so can you help me to apply some of the Agile principles? I don't think really Scrum is it's too big for me, but some few of the Agile principles so we built a very tiny island of agility. And those islands are growing and, of course, disappearing through the company. And the company is kind of getting experience. What does it mean for us? Because the people from those islands, they are complaining sometimes and they are saying, like, well, you know, we feel alone. And I did my best in that island. It's very small, by the way. I've been living there at that island trying to be more agile, but nobody understands me. And I'm quite alone in this corporation or company. My manager doesn't even understand me. He put in my KPIs, try Agile, but he's not supporting me. So I just quit, and this small island will just disappear into the ocean. But of course, another few will arrive. And some of them are bigger, as I said, so they may be even successful. So what you try to do, you try to organize some local events like open cafes, internal cafes, where you share your experiences and try to get a message 
go all around. And if it's kind of a successful process, and the company is, well, maybe even if the company is small, but if the company is big, you will find such a manager and he's, well, well, at that meeting. Okay, so you've been doing these islands of agility a couple of months. How it went? So you say, well, it was quite good. We have those people who share their experiences, and there is a case study report from them, and there are some suggestions, and we are creating the methodics, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then he said, well, but how we measure the success? And how we found out how big those islands are? And what shall we do? So you need something how to measure it, which is actually very difficult. Because if you show this kind of a status to some of the Agile or Scrum trainers, they would say, well, these two are not Agile at all. Because, for example, they don't have this, or they are not going to doing good retrospectives over there. And even here, they don't have a real customer demos. So they are just presenting to internal business, which is not exactly what it should be. So you have one possibility to just say, OK, Scrum or Agile is just this, something on the very far away, or just find a way how to appreciate what those people are doing and name it somehow. So what we did uh, at some of the companies was to create some model. And uh, it has a different name. So they've been more complex with a lot of uh, description. What does it mean? But I think if you simplify it, it's just about this idea. The first level of agility could be just play with agile. That was the small, there was the small island which we have there, even smaller without the flowers. They just Think about it, and you have to tell them, well, now you are trying Agile, and you are really on the path to Agile. You are not Scrum yet, you are not really gaining all the benefits from that yet, but you are Agile. You are Agile level one, whatever it means, of course, just playing. Therefore, it has this label, play. Then you have a second label, it's about experimenting. So those people are usually trying to stand up and trying to have some boards, and maybe some of them were trying to do some iterations, but they've been not really fixed much, and uh, still kind of experiment. Still it was here to just gain the know-how, to try what does it mean for us. Because a lot of them are saying, well, you know, I can imagine that if I work for a company with four people, it would be easy. Well, actually, not so quite, but maybe easier than in the corporation. So that's uh, the second level. The third level is just to try. So they already say, OK, we want to try Kanban or Scrum or something like that. And here are the artifacts. Here are the celebrations. So we will try them. And we'll see what happens. Of course, we will find out tons of problems. For example, our business is not willing to come. We don't have a product owner, for example. Uh, well, we don't have any Scrum Master anymore, but we have two project managers, and so on and so on. So you try to change it and break it and use it. And then these two levels are kind of uh, here. So if, uh, are you familiar with the concept of shoe hurry? So to my opinion, these uh, kind of bluish three levels are coming to shoe. Just use whatever it is, try to experiment, try to build one practice up to another one. This one is more like into her. So they try to use it and try to adopt it, try to find their way. And the last one, which I called kind of a master, it might be even the re. It's something when they find, well, now we are here. We are successful, we are doing very good Agile, Scrum, Kanban, whatever, and it helped us. And we are so good, so we can help the other people, other companies, with our way. So it's a for a very long term. So once you have such a model, you might come back to that manager who wanted you to measure something and say, okay, we have a model here. So we are able to do the assessment how many islands are level one, 
how many islands are level two, and so on and so on. And he might agree or he might uh, want to say, okay, how are you going to assess? So are you going to put this form and they will fill it? Then they say, well, no, that's not uh, the way how it works. So that's the problematic part as well. But let's say they agreed on such kind of a model. Then you've got uh, the next step is pretty much to say, well, we will do the assessment for the islands because we want to know not only how many islands we have, meaning how many projects are agile, but we want to know how many are having level one and how many are having level three or four or five, which is more important to us. So that's the one part. But the other part is that we are saying this manager, well, we've gained enough experiences here in the ocean. So we are able to split the organization into two groups or department. One which would be originally very small, which says, let's do this product fully agile. Let's take those people from there and move them to a completely different part of part of organization. Let's assign some senior head of senior manager for agile. So he is different. He understands how the manager should look like in agile world. And let's keep uh, those uh, pretty much waterfall, pretty much old fashioned with those islands where they can still experiment. And if you found another piece of land, we may still extend it like that. So that's uh, the next step. If you fail doing that, you will most likely not get anywhere. So these islands are very good to begin with, but then at some point of the time, you need some pressure from the app. And we have still four minutes, so it's uh, one of the last slides and it's time for you to wake you up. So can you please stand up to do some short exercise? Because I want to show you it's, the Agile is very easy. It's all in your head and you can do even the things which you feel they are not so easy. So first I will show you what are we going to do and then you try it. So what you do is uh, you will point in front of you then you will close your eyes and turn right as much as you can. At the very end, you open your eyes and remember the place where you've been. Ready? Okay, so point up front, close your eyes, close your eyes and turn right. Be careful on the people around you. Open your eyes again. You should not be moving, you should be standing. So remember the spot, turn back. And then just uh, think about the spot, which is just a little bit more far to the right. Just spend a few seconds imagining that you make it. And try it again. Point up front, close your eyes. Have the vision of your picture of the spot which is a little bit more right and turn right as much as you can. Open your eyes. So for how many of you it was more far than the first one? Quite a lot. Thank you very much. It's all in your head. And if you remember this, you will find out it's not so difficult. You can do it. You can adopt Agile. It's very easy. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, there is some networking party outside, so I'll be around. Or um, I don't know if we have two minutes, so you can ask a few questions if you like. Hello. Uh, Hello. You have shown a very good example of how local Agile team is dealing with the existing problem. And what about remote Agile team? Do you think it's possible to deal with the, with the orcs? How, well, how? it is. I, I knew quite a lot of very distributed Agile teams. But uh, it's extremely difficult. So it needs... Uh, 
Once, uh, let's, say, let's say that you are lucky and you're working in a small company which is co-located, then you learn something by yourself, go to one training, and you are extremely good, so you may be able to adopt Agile by yourself and don't need anybody to help you. Don't need even yourself to have experience. But then you are working in a distributed team, even with a huge corporation. One is in India, second one is here, third one would be, for example, in the uh, US, and so on and so on. Then I believe you need to have real experienced person, either yourself, got experience, how it really works. That's the first part. So be really expert on all the Scrum, Agile, and understand it deeply. Second thing, you have to understand how the communication and kind of psychology is working. So you are able to build self-organized team in this really difficult environment. And it's possible. You are using a couple of ideas from psychology and uh, really coaching skills and facilitation skills. And you can still make it. So any other questions? Hello, you mentioned the importance to change the attitude that the, the team should care of, uh, and should look, uh, should look the uh, business eyes about the task they do versus just delivering tasks in a certain way we used to. But uh, how would you recommend to change that attitude for the people so that they care? Because for lots of them, it's they get used to a certain way and they feel happy and even do not feel willing to see differently. And, so, from your experience, how would you recommend? Well, I think uh, you need at least one enthusiastic. It's about the change management. There is a video, you can Google it. It's uh, about one person who makes uh, dance uh, the whole... It was uh, some festival for music, but he was really dancing really crazy. And he was the only one. But once he got two followers who have been enthusiastic about dancing, then after some very short period of a time, all the crowd, like here, have been dancing together with them and really crazy movements and so on. So if you apply this change management thing, which says, well, it's not enough if I'm alone. Maybe for some people it's enough. But if you are alone, enthusiastic person, and want to change your team, then you have to find at least two followers who would help you with that. So search first, not for how to attract everyone, because it might be too much for now, for you, but search how to attract one, then second person. So they will help you. And they will make it uh, more living, and then you are free to attract others. So thank you for the question. And we want to thank oh, you. Thank you very Small much. Small gift. Wow, that's cool. Thank you. And now